Hello and welcome to this mini lesson from Inside the PE Portal. Today we are looking at somatotypes and energy balance and how they're a little bit related. So we can start off on this side with somatotypes, for which there are three. Now somatotyping, before I put them down here, research has come out since this theory of, uh, emerged and it's been discredited by some and backed up by others. But just bear in mind that this is not absolute fact. This is an opinion when trying to apply somatotypes into sport and the causes behind somatotypes forming. When we look at energy balance, this is one way in which we can sort of under, undercut, um, undermine somatotyping, but we'll get to that later on. So somatotypes, we have three different types. The first is ectomorph. An ectomorph. This is typically someone who is narrow at the top, across the shoulders, and narrow at the hips, giving them this long, linear shape. We then have mesomorph. Mesomorph, which are typically, so mesomorphs, are typically wider at the shoulders, narrow at the hips, giving them this sort of triangular shape, almost. And then we have endomorphs. Endomorphs, who are both wide at the shoulders and wide at the hips, giving them a boxing or rectangular look. So there are three different types, and broadly speaking, someone is more one than the other. But luckily, somatotyping gives us a way to actually measure someone's linearity or length, someone's muscularity or mesomorph, and someone's fatness, their endomorph measure. And the measure is on a scale of one to seven. Seven being the extreme, one being the absolute lot. So let's say someone was an extreme ectomorph, then we would consider them to be one on endomorph, one on mesomorph and seven on ectomorph. If someone were an extreme mesomorph, they were absolutely, you know, the, the archetype of wide, narrow, muscular, then they would be one, seven, one. And then likewise for endomorph, if someone was the epitome of wide and wide, high fat mass, high muscle mass, then it would be seven, one, one. Now, obviously, very few people are going to be an extreme. People are going to be a mixture of all of them. So if you were to take linearity and grade them one to seven, then you would change that third figure. Then you could change their mesomorph figure in the middle. Then you could change their endomorph figure at the end. So what do these actually incorporate and how might it suit sport performances? So ectomorph typically have low muscle, low fat, and low speed and power. Mesomorphs typically have high muscle, low fat, high speed and power. Endomorphs typically have high muscle, low fat, but not necessarily the most powerful. They might have strength because of their muscle mass, but not necessarily the power output of mesomorphs because of that additional fat mass inside of their body. So who would suit different sports? Ectomorphs, so if we think about low muscle, low power, low fat, good endurance, these are your endurance athletes, or perhaps positions in sport where height might be advantageous. So perhaps netball or basketball, Perhaps marathon running. For our mesomorph with high strength and power, lots of muscle but low fat, our power athletes, dynamic athletes, potentially invasion games performers, centres in netball, centre midfielders in football, and then endomorphs, those who aren't necessarily the most powerful but they're strong. They've got high muscle mass, high, that's meant to be a high fat mass, apologies. 
high muscle mass and high fat mass. This could be your forwards in rugby, so your props, for example. It could be your main defenders in American football, whereby they need to be strong to try and stop a resistance or overcome a resistance, but it doesn't necessarily mean or matter how fast they put a stop to something. It could be a weightlifter who's graded on how much weight they can lift, not necessarily how fast they can lift it and how far they can throw it. So somatotyping, three different areas, ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph, we've got the three typical shapes and how to score them. Then we've got some characteristics. Low muscle, low fat, low speed and power for our ectomorph. High muscle, low fat, high speed and power for mesomorph. And then high muscle and high fat and relatively okay power but high strength when it comes to endomorphs. So how does energy balance link to all of this? Well, first of all, we need to know what energy balance is. And it's in equals out. And what we're referring to here is energy. Consumption versus expenditure. Consume versus expend. And if these match up, just like a balancing scale, if they match up and they are equal, then we are in energy balance. If calories in, kcal, equals kilocalories out, then we remain in balance. But if we tilt this in either way, we get a change. So in this scenario, if someone appears to be one of these, then we are less likely to see them change again. If someone has got high fat mass and they appear to be an endomorph and they remain in energy balance, they are likely to stay that shape. They might change a little bit with some muscle hypertrophy, but if their energy in and out stays the same, they're largely going to stay the same on their somatotype as well. But if we start to change it and we consume more than what we expend, so our consumption in is greater than our expenditure out, then we start to retain energy. How? We store it as fat mass around our body. And suddenly we'll start to see someone who may have been an ectomorph start to move towards perhaps mesomorph because they've got additional energy that can go into muscle production. And then if they continue this positive energy balance where there's more coming in, they might end up in endomorph territory because fat mass starts to accumulate potentially around their middle, giving the appearance of wider hips. The same can also be said for negative energy balance, where what comes in is less than what goes out. This is a negative energy balance. In doesn't match out. And this is where we start to see someone drop back down. Someone who might appear to be an endomorph with a high fat mass, high fat mass, and gradually they start to use and utilize that stored fat because they haven't got as much coming in and they need to find the energy from somewhere. So they use the fat around their body and it might go from around the middle, making them appear to be a mesomorph. And it might continue to the point that muscle starts to atrophy. It starts to reduce in size because they haven't got the energy to fuel it and to keep it the same size. And then they might then start to go back into ectomorph territory. Now this obviously doesn't affect someone's height. This is only affecting fat and muscle composition or body composition. So energy balance in versus out. For a woman, typically, needs 2,000 kilocalories per day to be in energy balance. Typically, males need 2,500. Now, this is completely dependent on their own circumstances, which is what we're going to look at in a second. Just bear those numbers in mind, 2,000 and 2,500. So what are four things that can impact those numbers? What are four things that can tilt this scale back and forth? We've got a person's age, 
we've got the person's gender, as we just said, we've got a person's height, and we've got a person's activity levels. Younger people typically move more. They are typically in organised sports and activities because their parents put them in it. They have play times, break, lunch time. They're more likely to play in their spare time. You don't typically find adults climbing trees because they've got a spare 15 minutes. You'll probably find an adult catching up on some work on a laptop. At work, they don't go and play outside in the bark area or on a climbing frame. They might go and sit down in a coffee shop and talk over something from work. Gender. Typically, men have more muscle mass. Typically, women have more fat mass. Muscle requires more energy because it's contractible. Fat doesn't require as much energy because it's not contractible. So just that subtle difference can put male energy demands up higher. Typically, men are larger than women, which plays into our next one down here, which is height. The more body someone has, the more bone, the more tissue, the bigger the heart, the bigger the organs, then the more energy it takes to sustain life. So the bigger the person, the more muscle, the higher they are, or the taller they are, the more stuff they have that requires energy. And then if they put that into action, and if they actually move and contract their muscles, then that's going to require energy as well. So, thinking back to those two figures, 2,000 on average for women, and 2,500 on average for men, that is very, very changeable. You could have a man who might require 1,900. You might have a woman who requires 3,800, depending on their activity, their height, their age, and what they do day to day. And if they start to play around with their energy balance, if they go into a positive one or a negative one, they might start to see a change in their somatotype. Either way, they might start to see a change in their muscle mass. They might start to see a change in their fat mass. And that is that somatotyping and energy balance. Hope you found that useful, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next one. Bye for now.